Hello. Next up, nothing to hide from Kirill's. Some citizens complain about being under surveillance, but they are told that if they have nothing to hide, they have nothing to fear. Still, news media regularly covers cases where citizens with unusual behavior are put on suspicious lists, even though they have broken no laws. This is actually a quote from a book, not a news article yet. Um, a small book, Edgar Grams, edition number 300, um, written by Jasper Lund. But um, I invite you to take a look at this short collection of short articles and see what the future holds, privacy-wise. Now, the main confusion with the nothing to hide argument is this right here. If anyone of you still remembers this, this notation right here, uh, if not, what it means that for everyone who is a criminal, that everyone has something to hide. Then the middle line here says, from that follows that for everyone who has something to hide, that everyone is a criminal. And that, of course, is wrong. But if we don't put these words in a mathematical representation, then for some people, that makes sense. On a daily basis, we think, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good argument, right? Only, only criminals have things to hide, so if you have something to hide, you must be a criminal. Well, that is not the case. And I'm also bringing something new to the table, at least, at least I think it's new. Um, I believe, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm right, but I believe I created a concept that, that I call uh, Schrodinger's video camera. So what's Schrodinger's video camera? Imagine you have a nice apartment like this one here in Paris. And uh, you live there. One day you notice that outside the apartment on the wall, someone has installed a PTZ camera dome. It's, it's not uh, transparent, it's an opaque dome, so it's, it's a black one. You don't see where the camera is pointing. You're not even sure if there is a camera, but the feeling you get, is it a good feeling? Like, do you, does it matter to you if you're being surveilled or not? Or is privacy maybe just a little bit about the feeling of staying private? Maybe there's a camera in there. Maybe it's being rotated to you. Maybe they're zooming in on you. Maybe there's nothing in there. Maybe just a security dome, like a fake camera, a prop. You don't know. But still, I think for most of us, the feeling is not a positive one. So it's not about actually being surveilled, it's about feeling private. And what is privacy? Privacy has multiple facets, I'd say. Um, first of all, it's an autonomous right to choose who processes my information. Like maybe I like to, well, let's go IT, let's talk about IT, right? Uh, maybe I like to work with Google, but I, but I hate working with DuckDuckGo. I don't want DuckDuckGo to have my search queries, so I just go to Google. It's my right to choose. How is my info processed? Right? If I give someone my information, my home address, to send me um, a postcard, that doesn't mean I consent to that home address being published on the internet. That's the how of data privacy. And what information is processed, right? If someone has my home address, it doesn't mean I'm okay with them having my phone number or vice versa. And a different facet of that is right to decide who I interact with, right? The, the classical right to privacy before we've had so much information around. Um, we can call it the, the right to be left alone. If I don't want to talk to anyone, I, I don't talk to anyone. That is the reason why I don't have uh, a phone number. I do have a phone. Uh, not, not, not like some other guys here, um, kudos to those. There are at least two guys, two speakers at the conference that, that, don't, that don't use the phone I do. But I don't have a phone number, because I, I want to be left alone. When I want to interact with someone, I'll go and ask. If they want to talk to me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them. I don't have a doorbell, for reals. I want to be left alone. Uh, and I don't give people my address as well. So um, those are the fundamental aspects of privacy to me. 
Now, I've given a presentation on the topic of privacy in the past year. Uh, I've given one here in Balkan a year ago. Uh, I've also given one at uh, 35C3 Chaos West. And I've gotten some reactions from people in all the presentations I've given on the privacy topic. So let's take a look at some of them. Um, and this is a positive reaction, of course, five times up. I'm feeling like you with recapture. Uh, take a look at my previous presentation. I, I tried not to include any slides for, from that uh, today because year has passed, but, but it's also, uh, I hope, entertaining and, and eye-opening. So yeah, um, then we have uh, stuff like that. Interesting and also not worth it at all. Your time on this planet is limited, you know. Then we got in some comments after presentation, like it's pointless anyway. You have a phone, you're on Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and of course, this, this was the best here. Why are you presenting your presentation without a face mask if you care about privacy so much? Well, if you listen carefully, you know the answer to these questions. Privacy is about consent. And, and I'm okay with you taking photos of me or my slides or filming me and putting me online while I'm standing here. When I'm gonna go and sit over there, I don't wanna be filmed or I don't want my photos to be taken. So it's all about consent. But um, let's, let's take a look at this rather good argument. Your time on this planet is limited. Um, I do think about it a lot. And, and yeah, I have to make some hard choices, right? We, we, we aren't here forever, like maybe 50 years, 100 years, if, if you're lucky. Um, so it does cost a lot of time and money. Um, so you have to find some balance. But then again, if you got nothing to hide, I have some more arguments for you, right? One is data hoarding. So someone that just collects a piece of information about you that may be not a threat, not, not much of a threat. But if someone, say government is in that position usually, uh, collects a lot of information about you, then they hoard the data about you and it can lead to various consequences. Like for example, they can impersonate you, uh, which is not what the government usually does, right? But blackmail, uh, we don't know, no, no, one, no one is admitting uh, ops like that, but, but uh, oh, they did. Uh, I think US government admitted blackmailing, um, who was that? Uh, Martin Luther King, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that stuff happens. Um, so data hoarding leads to problems, like, uh, and not only government, large corporations can hoard data on you and they can, they can uh, impersonate you, or hackers can hack that data stash and then impersonate you. Now, back to governments. Um, most of us are happy enough, lucky enough to live in countries with relatively good governments that, that don't go killing people or, or putting them in jail for no good reason. The, most of them, most of the people, some, some, some get, do end up in jail for no good reason, unfortunately. But today's government that we have today might not be there for long. Government doesn't usually live for a hundred or even 50 years. It, it, it lives for like four or five years and you don't know what you will get. And it might be replaced by a totalitarian or simply inhumane regime. And now that it has all the data on you, what will do with the data? Now that it knows stuff that is okay, luckily, to know today, like someone's sexual orientation or political affiliation might end might end you up on, on, on a watch list or a kill list. And then herd immunity, finally. This is the most important for me. This is actually the real reason why, I, why I'm, I'm not wearing a face mask giving this presentation. Um, I don't really care about my privacy so much. I, I, I care about people who really need privacy. Uh, people who are not in the position to do as I do. Who, who cannot uh, fight their governments on, or, or who, who cannot come to a hotel in Serbia and tell them, I'm not, I'm not allowing you to copy my ID here. You can see it, but you're not copying it, right? Because I know I have, uh, I have friends here, here, here at the conference who would really like me to speak, or, or if, um, if they kick me out of the hotel, uh, they would provide something else for me. Um, so many people are not in position like that. So I want to support the people who, really need that. Because many people not hiding anything will make the few that do have something to hide stand out more and automatically draw suspicion just because they are hiding something. And that is, that is important. Now for the next part I want to talk about uh, privacy nightmares. So some of the things that I observe around me or online um, that, uh, that's not so good for privacy. 
Well, my presentation a year ago had uh, had this slide. The presentation started with my words, privacy is dead. And uh, a year ago I presented how, how, how in May last year, People's Daily China tweeted that, hey, we found a new use for surveillance cameras. Let's point them at our children that are learning in schools. And then we can, you know, have this nice uh, menu for the for the teacher. Then you see how many pupils are concentrating, how many uh, pupils are not paying attention, how many are afraid, right? Please don't call me out. I, I haven't done my homework. I see that immediately. Um, so that's a cool tech they had last year. Now, in January 2019, uh, there's a new thing from China. So Chinese schools scanning children's brains to see if they're concentrating. Apparently, the last system didn't have uh, enough data quality. Maybe, maybe it had a lot of false positives or false negatives. So uh, this, this should go well. But it's not only, uh, it's not only um, China specifically, right? We have, we have this, this thing here uh, where uh, people, uh, students, students, small, small children are getting into the school through a face scanner. And uh, so basically the marketing ploy on this one is it makes schools more secure because you can find missing children, you can, I'm sure you can reuse or abuse the information in, in, in a myriad of ways. Um, but as of if we talk about keeping bombers out of the school, I mean, it's not hard to jump that, that barrier for, for an adult, male or female. Um, so yeah, um, then we have Hong Kong, of course. Uh, this happened in June 2019. Um, people were being aware of tracking their movements and they were kind of afraid to use their metro cards. So what, what, what they were doing, they were buying paper tickets, even though they usually use this digital system. In Latvia, where I come from, we also have a digital system uh, for, for traveling in the public transport. And we actually had a case. It was uh, parts, of, parts of the case were public. Uh, unfortunately, um, a, a driver driving public transport ran the red light and, and killed someone. Uh, so uh, the police pulled record of, of all the personalized cards used on the transport and interrogated everybody. I mean, I'm, I'm all for resolving crimes in, in, in the reasonable manner, uh, but I believe in a society where everybody who, who has something to contribute to an investigation of that kind would go to the police themselves and say, yeah, I, I saw something. And, and if they didn't see something, they would not go to the police. So I kind of look, look down upon um, police using, using this data like that. But I mean, it can be used in other ways, for sure, if they have the access to the data. Here, uh, for, for protests in Hong Kong, people were afraid that they will end up on some watch list because of going to the protests. So they were smart enough uh, to use paper tickets. Luckily, we still have the option to buy paper tickets. If you look at my last year's presentation, uh, in Latvia for, say, a high, high school student or university student, uh, the difference between using a um, subsidized ticket or buying a paper ticket is a 666% increase, um, no joke, in, in, in the price. Now, let's talk about Facebook. Everyone loves Facebook. Anyone here is on Facebook? Uh, yeah, we have some people. A any one of you by their own free will? I get, I get my, f oh, we have someone. I get my friends threatening me all the time. We're gonna make you a Facebook account if you don't, if you don't join. Yeah, sometimes they do, but then, then I talk to them nicely and, and they, you know, they remove the Facebook account to get, to get, get back access to their computer. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is a quote this is an article actually that has some quotes surrounding a court case where Facebook was uh, was either put on trial or being put on trial. I'm not I'm not an expert on the American legal system. Um, so what they said, what Facebook representative said is there is no privacy interest in using Facebook because by sharing with a hundred friends on a social media platform, which is an affirmative social act to publish, to disclose, to share ostensibly private information with a hundred people. You have just, under centuries of common law, under the judgment of Congress, under the SCA, negated any reasonable expectation of privacy. So, once again, this here is about data reuse. Their argument is, you published it to your friends, so it's public domain. Like, we can copy it, we can, uh, we can do whatever we want with it. If someone has 
if some of the Facebook users here have actually read the agreement they have with Facebook, maybe legally that's the case. I'm not sure. I, I haven't read it, but just because I'm not a Facebook user, because I, I actually have read all my license agreements with, with Twitter and, and other software that I use. Um, some 10 years ago, I was working for an international company um, that had an office where I live. And uh, on, on, on my first day when, when they had this onboarding meeting, they told me this is the software you're gonna use. Um, I looked at the software, I tried to launch it. It, it presented me with an agreement. And I, I went back to my superior, I said, hey, there's, there's agreement for, for almost all the software, what do I do? It's an American company. So they said, well, I mean, you have to read it. So, so uh, they were paying me for almost four full days uh, to read license agreements for, for the software I was gonna use. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, since then, I read the license agreements. So, but here, in this Facebook case, um, they are, in my opinion, misunderstanding a basic fact about privacy. It's still about consent, it's about my consent. If I have consented to share this piece of information with one of my friends, or with a hundred of my friends, or with 10,000 of my friends, it doesn't mean that a different person has the right to read it. Yes, the reality is such that it is hard to control. And the argument has some merit because um, the article also has, has some quotes like from, uh, that relate to, to the Middle Ages, I think, where, or, or after that, when you go to a public square and just shout stuff out, right? No reasonable expectation of privacy there. But I mean, with today's technology, if you had a drone looking at who's hearing what you're shouting, maybe you could hold them, hold them accountable and not propagate the information any further. One more thing about Facebook, uh, suicide prevention. Uh, if, if you have read an article uh, about suicide prevention on Facebook, um, anyone thinks it's a, it's a good thing, a cool thing? Uh, something with the need? Bad, yeah, yeah, some people do. Uh, that's it a bad, is that it is a bad thing? Yeah, some people do as well. Um, so yeah, I also personally have mixed feelings about that. I mean, suicide prevention is an important uh, task that, that, that needs to be carried out at some point, but the, the way Facebook carries it out is, is quite creepy, maybe even unnecessary creepy, in my opinion. So this is uh, from their official, um, official description of, of, the, of the tool, of the algorithm. They also have this nice picture in there um, about how it works. So we have some um, signals, right? For example, what you type, when you type it, uh, what day you type it on. They also analyze the comments that people add. Uh, then they have some magical algorithms, AI, basically machine learning, um, that decides if the post should be reviewed by a human or not. And then it's reviewed by a human. And then the human can take action. And there are a couple actions they can take. They can send tips or resources, or they can escalate to local authorities. Now, I would prefer to see an algorithm like that, even the algorithms are creepy even more creepier than humans, in my opinion. Because, you know, it's, it's not a human, you don't know what it thinks. Um, so, I would prefer human not to be involved in this, because uh, one of the two actions, send tips and resources, is this. So basically, uh, this stuff appears on your Facebook screen. That, that's it, that's the action. So, false positive wouldn't be too damaging to, to, to the user. And I mean, Facebook is investing a lot to draw people to continue to continuously use it. So, I mean, users wouldn't stop using it just because they get some false positives like that, I think. Um, so, involving a human is, is maybe not that necessary at, at that point. Now, continuing on the topic of Facebook, uh, there's this new cool thing called uh, Facebook dating. Um, it appeared in the, in the US, it was rolled out just now, and it's coming to you at the beginning of next year. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, so, actually, from the article, because I haven't haven't taken a look at it yet. Uh, from the article, it seems that Facebook is rolling out some uh, additional privacy features alongside Facebook dating, uh, which is something that people in the US don't get. People in the EU get the GDPR thing, and Facebook is really tough on, on things, right? Which is, which is making life harder for, for stalkers and other bad people. Um, in the US, they don't have such a tight obligation to do that. But with Facebook dating, they're bringing some of the EU features to, to the US, which is good. But one thing that Facebook dating is bringing to the US and most likely the EU as well is location confirmation. So in order to be able to ever use the feature, you have to have a GPS enabled device and it has to have been on.
at some point. If you want to change your location for some reason, well, likely you have moved or you have traveled, the GPS has to have been on at the new location again. Uh, so we are actually going to be providing the security conscious of us are going to be providing more data to Facebook if we decide to use the feature. Then um, for CCTV, um, I had uh, this slide in my presentation last year. This is from UK. All of those three are real posters uh, from the streets of the UK, government watching you. Um, but what do I have to add? Well, now they're doing this stuff, facial recognition. A man was fined 90 pounds for refusing to show his face to police trialing new facial recognition software. I read the article carefully. I read alternate sources. That's it. That was the crime. Not showing face to the software. And he was forced to show the face to the software and fined. He, he wasn't fined anything else. He wasn't under warrant, warrant or, or nothing, nothing. He, he just was walking by, uh, pulled his jumper above his chin, and that's it. And they hey, you suspicious. You scan your face right now. So that's where we're living in. Then we have this thing, the end of <laughs> the end of end to end encryption. Um, it's coming, unfortunately. Um, GCHQ suggested that uh, we need to end this thing. They even called it warrant proof encryption, which again it's it is, in a way, warrant proof, but is it bad or not? That is, that is a debatable thing. GCHQ isn't the only one trying to do that. Basically, Five Eyes is, is on to end to, to encryption, and they want to they wanna end it. And the first country, the first large country was, was, was enough impact that that's actually uh, doing that already is, of course, Australia. Uh, they've had the, the law, which is not like 100% hard law saying no, but it's 99%, like no end-to-end -end encryption, like, or you have to give access somehow. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, in, uh, in, in power for half a year, maybe a year. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we're, we're going to struggle with end-to-end -end encryption now, because Australia has that, Five Eyes want that. In a year, I bet one of the large... WhatsApp's, oh, sorry, messaging applications uh, are going to implement something about that. So, speaking of WhatsApp, <coughs> this thing happened. Um, so, an article appeared uh, saying that in, in the WhatsApp help, saying that rooted phones are not supported by WhatsApp anymore. So, you, you can't use rooted phone. Wonder why? Well, they say. Because that way we can't provide the security that we're supposed to provide you. Or in their, wor in their, wor in their words, WhatsApp security model cannot function as intended. Wonder what their model is. Uh, we also have the same, of course, for uh, iOS. Same stuff, no jailbroken phones, sorry, not going to work. So if you can't use rooted Android phones and if you can't use jailbroken iOS devices, what do you do? Because web doesn't work without a mobile device for WhatsApp. Well, obviously. You use a third-party app for WhatsApp. Oh, wait, but you can't really use that. And they've been doing that for five years, but, but they are doing that like every two years. And, and beginning of this year, they started this new cycle again, warning everyone, do not use unofficial apps. You're going to be blocked, right? And it's, it's been there in their information materials for quite some time, right? Uh, your account can get temporarily banned. That means you used an unofficial app. Please don't do that. So use an official app. So we're screwed. Uh, we can't block WhatsApp from doing bad stuff uh, through routing our phone. We can't install third-party apps. We're not allowed to. Luckily, we have other services, but we'll see what happens uh, with them. Because um, personally, I'm, I'm not so sure that government would hesitate to, to block a whole service if they run out of options. Or maybe block VPNs, for example, like some countries have been doing. Um, Russia, China. And uh, one of the Saudi countries, the VPNs are banned. Latvia, where I'm from, has started the debate on blocking VPNs, even though four years ago I was part of governmental discussion saying, this is a slippery slope. You're going to end banning VPNs if you do the censorship stuff. They did the censorship stuff. And now they're going to want to ban VPNs. Um, now, it's a bit depressing, right? I see lots of frowny faces. Let's, let's talk about the good stuff, GDPR. Uh, GDPR is good, uh, especially for those living in the EU. Um, I think actually you can kind of you can kind of pretend to be in the EU to to, to use GDPR uh, in in some circumstances. I haven't seen any research done on that, but if someone wants to do a presentation next Balkan, maybe you can 
do some research. Like, can you can you use GDPR for good if you're not a EU citizen? Anyway, so some of you, quite many of you, not half, but quite many of you are EU citizens. I'm going to tell you what you can get. And those of you who can become uh, EU citizens either by joining the the great union or or by uh, by, by by simply. Um, becoming citizen of an EU state. This is what we get. This is, this is how we can protect, and I've, uh, protect our data. And I've used many of those quite ex extensively. Uh, the thing is, we've had GDPR-like legislation in Latvia for the past 18 years uh, before GDPR came along. So nothing really changed except it's fines. We had maximum fine of 500 euros. Now it's a million or whatever. Um, so that changed. So you get the right to know who is processing what and why. And there's a, a list of things uh, that um, that you can get from the data processor. Um, the next couple of slides have, have been uh, legally taken from the European Union. They said you can use them as long as you quote the author. So copyright European Union. Um, yeah. So you can get all all bunch of this stuff. And what I do with that, I mostly piss off bad data processors. So if they if they abuse my data, I just send the request for everything. When did you get it? Who did you get it? How do you process it? Do you have any automation? Stuff like that. And then, and then they have to write the answer to that. We'll have questions in the end. Please write it down so we remember that. Um, then you can also have the right to object. You can say, nope, I don't want you to process my data anymore um, yeah, in case you've given it to them. You also have the right uh, to have the data deleted. It's a bit different from the other one, right? One is uh, if they're processing it based on the law. The other one is if they're processing it based on the contract. Uh, if you have a contract, like uh, you, can, you can have the data deleted. For example, if you uh, submit a photo to a non-governmental entity for some reason for a contract, you can have it deleted. Nice, huh? Um, and you can also access your own data, right? You can ask, give me everything you know about me. And those things lead to, of course, the right to move your data. If you can get your data and you can delete your data, you can move it to a different provider. Um, and uh, this right specifically tells it has to be in a reasonable format. So they can't send you uh, scanned, handwritten notes with your data. If they have it in database, they have to give it to you in a database-like format so you can port it easily. Uh, the right to correct your data, of course, is very important. Um, credit registries are a huge thing in the U.S. and a smaller thing in the EU. If they have wrong data about you, you can't you can't do anything unless you like cash a lot, like I do, uh, and and then you don't care about what banks think about you. Uh, but uh, having the right to correct your data is a good thing, and um, and this is the best one. You have a right to have a say when decisions are automated. So we have a bunch of startups doing all this AI machine learning crap. Uh, and basically, you submit some data, and they say, OK, you're going to use the app. You're not going to use the app. Uh, you're going to do that. You're not going to do that. You're going to have credit. You're going to have smaller credit. And you have a right to say, I want human review on that. Unless it's government mandated, then, then you don't have the right to do that. So I've exercised that right on a service. Uh, it was providing. Um, Taxi. It was a taxi app. It was providing transportation. So I said, "Hey, I don't, I don't like you banning my prepaid payment cards. Uh, I need a human to review the decision because it's not fraud. That's my prepaid payment card. Yes, I have ten of them because the limit is 100 euros, and I buy them each month. Um, and uh, yeah, they basically sent me a letter saying, "Okay, since you don't trust us to do automatic review, we are deleting your user. So we're going to court on that one." Um, right. Now we 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 touched uh, we already touched uh, the stories part. So last year I gave a bunch of stories about how my life is going, doing doing privacy uh, enforcement for myself. I have new stories for you, including we'll talk more about the taxi app as well. Uh, but um, let's start with certification. I mean I don't I don't personally I'm not a big fan of certification, but I have to have certification because of reasons. So I do certification exams. I do a lot of them, usually like two or three new certificates per year. Um, and every time they want to take and store a photo of my face. And I can't understand why. So every time I write them, um, it's not a GDPR, but this, uh, there's this EU-US agreement called Privacy Shield, uh, which is supposed to protect EU citizens when data is processed in the US. So I write them a Privacy Shield request every time after successfully passing an exam saying, hey, great exam, delete my biometrics, including my face. And every time they delete it after after some discussion, and and then they take the photo again. Like they don't get tired of that. Every time I suggest maybe next time don't force me to take a photo. They ignore that. So okay, that's their right. My right is to, is to request the deletion. So one time, this is what happened. 
Um, I requested the data deletion. They deleted the data, and then my certificates were gone. Um, so we had we had long conversation. It took about two months to restore the certificates. And you know what they asked me? Could you send us the list of certificates you want restored? Nice. Uh, I, I, of course, tried not to abuse that. I just said, nope, I'm not sending you. I could send you anything. You find the certificates. So they restored almost all the certificates, except some that I've taken during beta exams. Um, and I said, hey, you haven't restored all of them. Look, look deeper. So they looked for a couple more weeks, and they restored all the certificates. Yeah, they sincerely apologize. And, and now I'm thinking if there's a good lawyer who would talk that pro bono, because I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Oh, I mean, they apologize, so it's all good, right? Um, OK, mobile apps. Um, so this thing here, right? We have we have an app, um, iOS model currently also available on on the new versions of Android. When you when you have power to decide on permission to permission basis if you want the app to have that access or not. So here we have uh, an app asking you to access the contacts. Socratic would like to access your contacts, and iOS, uh, well, Apple, iOS developers, meaning Apple, uh, of course, provide a nice ability for the app creators to enter some custom text to explain what's going on. So Socratic has done that. They're saying, it's only for chatting about homework. Don't worry. OK, cool. So of course, you, you select the right option, well, I mean, the left option. Right? You press Don't Allow. And of course, Socratic says, we kind of need that. Sorry, go to settings. So that's what many apps do, and more and more apps will be doing, if not for GDPR. So that's kind of good. Um, then we have the, the taxi app. So our, our fight started kind of with this. They, they changed their brand and updated their visual identity. And you, you totally cannot see it in the picture. But under this white pop-up in the left corner, uh, there's a menu button where you can access all your write history, your email address, your data, logout, stuff like that. The button cannot be pressed because the pop-up is over it since the update. So I submitted the um, submitted the support request, and they asked me, "What is your email address?" I first asked, "Why do you need my email address? It's a bug in your app." Um, they said, "Sorry, we can't process um, we can't process any support request without an email address." So I, said, I, I wrote them, "Sorry, I can't access my email address. Your app doesn't work. I don't know what my email address is." So, but the good thing is, I could still use the app. I could still press the pickup manually button on the bottom there, and uh, I could I could call the taxi. So what I did is I uh, I came back from a conference to my airport. Um, I I called the taxi. I wrote down the taxi driver's name, the the license plate, the time I called for the taxi, the time I got in the taxi, the time I got out of the taxi, and I sent it to them. Hey, you probably can you know look in the database. This is me. That that's me. That's the guy. That's my driver. That's the license plate, and so on. And they told me, nope, we don't have access to that. So I created a different support account, wrote them an email. Hey, by the way, do you by any chance uh, store information on uh, which user drives, which, which car is a passenger at what time? They said, yeah. So then I went back to my first user, referenced the other support ticket, saying, hey, you have the data. And then they disappeared. So then we went to the paper, paper trail thing, he started writing to them. And, and that, is basically, uh, that is basically when they wrote me, uh, wrote me an official letter it's missing a signature, though, but, so we still have to. Allegedly, they wrote me an official letter. We still have to find out if it's they or not, um, saying that since you have lost trust in our application, we are here by removing your user from our application, which, of course, followed from my side by um, I exercised my right, which was not one of the uh, not one, not one of the rights on the slide, but it's also right under GDPR, uh, the right to temporarily block all processing of data. So if there's a dispute about your data processing, you have a right to to ask the company to not do anything with the data, put it away, and just wait for the court decision. So that's what I ask. Uh, so yeah, no, I don't have a taxi service. Too bad. Um, but we have another taxi service in Latvia. It's called Yandex Taxi. Um, it, it didn't work from the beginning. When I, when, I, when I installed it just to try it out, I, I was flying, I think, to Ukraine. Um, and uh, I, I use foreign SIM cards outside the EU. So I, I rode a taxi to the airport in Latvia. Um, I saw the driver put me five or five stars. I did the same to him. I turned off my phone, turned off the, turned off the app, turned off my phone, put an Ukrainian SIM card, come back to Latvia, put back my SIM card, turn on the phone, open the taxi app, taxi app says, Hey, good news. You can ride with Yandex Taxi next time in 2022, December 31st. You've been banned. I don't know. I mean, crazy stuff. So um, now, 
only this year they actually published the privacy policy outlining what kind of information they need. And for some information they say, yeah, we need location to provide you better service, but you can turn off location through the settings and then it's all fine. Now, but there are categories of um, data that you cannot not give them. Right? For example, it's super important for them to have user interaction, like scrolling, clicking, and interacting with the menu. Otherwise, app cannot work. Uh, it's super important for them to know who made your device, what operating system is, and what version is, what your screen size. The sensor information, like what sensor do you have in your phone? Is camera a sensor? I don't know, maybe. Device identifiers and so on. Amount of disk space, list of installed apps. And it, it all goes to, to an app that's owned by a company in Russia. So, and you can't turn it off. There, there we go. Um, continuing with mobile apps. Messaging anonymously. Last year I told, yeah, I found a way to message anonymously. Um, well, actually I told it's hard to message anonymously, I have no way. Then, then I spoke to some people and now I have all the messaging apps. Each of them has a separate phone number. I travel a lot to cons, so I just take a conference, uh, conference mobile card, I register an account, and I have my account. So that's great. Uh, the problem is when it expires, someone can go and re-register it. So what do you do? You use lock codes. You lock down your account. But what happens then? Then every like month or even more often the app says, hey, do you still remember your PIN? No, I don't remember my PIN. I've written it down somewhere just in case, but I don't want to remember it. It's a throwaway account. But you get these reminders, so it's a bit annoying that way. How do you actually buy apps anonymously? Well, I haven't given, uh, I, I use, this, this is an iPhone here, I use an iPhone. I haven't given my credit card, I don't have a credit card, but I, I haven't given any of my information to Apple, so it's, it's a fake name, don't tell them, and, and a fake address and doesn't have a credit card. So sometimes there are some good apps that you want to, or need to pay for, doesn't matter, I, I want to pay for good apps. Uh, how do you buy them? Well, gift cards, obviously. You ask a friend to, to, give, you, uh, to give you a gift card. And the good thing is, you don't actually have to enter a, a real email at all. You can enter localhost at localhost, and the email gets sent to nowhere, but the, peop the person buying it gets a prompt, do you want to print out the gift card? And there's a code in there, so you, you take the gift card code and you, and you use that. You, 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 yeah. But I mean, it, it, does, it does have a toll on my friends. I mean, they get, they get tired of me asking for shit all the time. <laughs> so privacy is, privacy is hard, kind of, yeah. <clears throat> then, um, Last, last year, uh, I told you, I've been, uh, I've been interested in privacy for five to 10 years. Well, apparently that's not true. Turns out I've been into privacy for at least 15 years. This is a voucher to access a conference for free um, from 2004. Um, on top there's my name, and afterwards there is an address, which is an address of a hotel uh, that I've never rented a room in. Um, so, apparently somehow 15 years ago I thought it's not a good idea to give these guys my home address. Speaking of home address, I still don't give people my home address, but I love to receive mail, so I use post office boxes. I don't know how much it costs in your countries. In Latvia it's around 15 euros per year, and you get a post office box, it's amazing. Um, but we are getting these new age people, like I've actually had I've actually had a situation with, with a government agency uh, this month. Uh, they apologized to me saying, uh, so uh, a, young, uh, a young lady talked to me in, in, in the agency and, and told me, sorry, I'm not from the Soviet times, I didn't know what that address means. So uh, I, I, we, were, we were communicating with government agencies through postal mail as I do, and I had my PO box on it as the return address, and they didn't send me the reply through there. Instead they Googled me and sent me an email. Uh, so yeah, apparently that's old people stuff using using PO boxes. But uh, I mean, it's nice, secure, and you can send me send me stuff. So yeah, airport scanners, the the new ones. Um, those are those are good, right? It's fast, secure, and safe, and no radiation at all, uh, or not. Um, so yeah, you can actually opt out of those, and I suggest you do. And I think it's almost like everywhere except UK. I mean, uh, the Australia oh Australia also you don't get to do that. Oh, too bad. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's under the Queen, right? So obviously, um, maybe they did at the same time, right? Because uh, UK had an opt-out. Then they decided, nope, no opt-outs. I mean, you you have 
they positioned like that. You have an opt-out. You can go through the scanner, or you can opt-out and not fly. That's, that's your choice. Um, then the European court went and told, nope, UK, you're doing it wrong. You have it written right here. That is not the way you do it. So now you can opt out. But, uh, well, not for long. If Brexit happens, then they, they have already announced plans to put it back as, uh, well, mandatory opt-out thingy where, where you have to, have to do it. Yeah? Uh, don't do it. One thing, one thing I dislike about those uh, alongside radiation is, of course, uh, the automated decision, which is interesting under, under GDPR. I mean, you could, ask, uh, you could ask under GDPR to say, I don't want AI taking decision on whether I'm suspicious or not. I want a human to take that decision. Because that's, once again, I find algorithms creepy. I prefer humans when, when possible. And um, finally, boarding passes in shops in the airport. It's gotten worse since GDPR. I don't know why. Before GDPR, I had problems like maybe 20, 30% of the times when buying stuff in, in, in an airport. Like they, they ask you for the boarding pass. I say to them, no thanks. Then they thought I didn't hear what they said. So they repeat again. I said, no thanks. I don't, I don't want to give you my boarding pass. Blah, 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 longer one. So, and then they go away. Well, they, they, they back off about the boarding pass. Now since GDPR, 100% of time I have to call a supervisor. I don't know what's going on. They're like, no, we have to scan because the system is made in a way that it won't let you, let you buy anything. So my question, of course, is how are you going to use my name and how are you going to use my frequent flyer number? What are you going to be doing with that? Um, so they can never answer that question. When you call a supervisor, they say the system only stores your flight number. So I say my flight number is BT641. Then they say, oh, OK. Supervisor knows. The employees don't know how to hack their own system there. Uh, so it's a bit sad. So my idea coming here to this conference and almost not being able to buy a thing again is let's make a barcode app for shopping. How about that? I'm, I'm on board. I'm going to work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help. I need some more people. Come talk to me. Let's make an app. Uh, of course, we, we wouldn't be using it to, to get into uh, business launches or, or, or to get into an airplane or security zone, but for shopping, right? So let's make an app where, where you can just, just select what you need, press the button, show them the damn barcode, and they're happy, you're happy, everything moves along, <laughs> right? And, and yeah, people aren't mad at you. So the question, the subtitle of the presentation, of my talk is, should we fix privacy or not? So is it worth it? Should we work on it? Well, let's take a look at what have been done so far and how successful it was. The user demand. I mark it with a negative sign. Um, the users are not demanding privacy. We have not been able to fix it so far. Too bad. We had the cookie law in the EU in 2012. I mark it with a negative sign as well. That's the annoying thing. Uh, I don't actually know if people, for example, from the US, if coming here and using the local, oh, not here, but uh, coming to the EU and using a local network somewhere in the EU um, uh, makes, makes those things pop up and you don't see them at home or they pop up for everybody. I'm not sure. Uh, but in the EU, it, it, it's a pop-up saying, hey, we use cookies, press OK. So that's, that's a fix. And it hasn't fixed anything. Well, but now, since 2018, we have a GDPR. And for big data, GDPR hasn't fixed anything, because um, GDPR only applies to data that can be uh, tied to your identity. It doesn't have to have your real name in it per se, but it has to have enough real actual data to be able to identify that that is you. Big data doesn't qualify. If they can identify that that is a male uh, between ages of 20 and 30 living there liking that, that could be like any of the 10 males fitting the description. So that's not personal data under GDPR. So fail, fail in there. But GDPR in general for everything else, including some online things and many offline things, um, I mark it with a plus. It, it, has done, it has done a lot of good things. So it has given me some hope. Maybe fixing privacy, if it's a legal way to do it, or it's a technical way to do it, or it's a hacker way to do it. Maybe it's not a lost cause. And maybe we should, should just try for six more years to see what happens in 2025. Thank you.
So, um, if we have a mic, yeah, we do have a mic. We can we can take some questions. I can answer the first question already. Uh, so, I'm not wearing a hoodie uh, or or a mask because I consent to me being filmed. We have the second question over there. Yes, hi. Uh, I have a question under GDPR. How do you know that all your data has been given to you? I mean, you have no ways to check. Uh, yes, um, that's true. And the problem for Latvia is the Data Protection Authority uh, doesn't have the right to start criminal cases. And under administrative law, it's not really allowed just to go ransack in their databases, in the suspect company's databases. So that is problematic. Maybe in some countries they do have the authority, and then it's easy. But I do have a story about that. It's, it's an ongoing story. Data Protection Authority is looking into it. I do love our DPA. Um, actually, when, when they were looking for, for the head of the DPA, uh, I had three separate friends mailing me saying, hey, apply to that. That's your thing. So, But the story. Um, so. I recently noticed that in, in the internet bank of my bank, there's a section saying your data. I pressed your data, and there's just one button saying request your data. So I pressed the button. It said, in a week, you'll get your data. So a week later, I go to the internet bank. There's a PDF to download. I download the PDF. There's some data. Well, but I look at it, and it's like, it's like some data. I mean, I know there is the data in the internet bank itself. They do not have to give it in the PDF because I can access it. And then there's some other data that's not in the internet bank, and that's in the PDF. But I realize, um, I know from my experience as, as a pen tester, um, including working with financial institutions, that they have to store failed attempts for credit cards. And I did use credit cards like 10 years ago, and that wasn't included. I know from the, from the law on counterterrorism financing, or, or counterfinancing the terrorism, uh, that they have to store a photo of my face and a photo of my ID. And it's not including either. So that's an easy case. I go to the DPA and I go to the Financial Commission. I say, I say to them, so either they broke GDPR by not giving me the data or they're breaking the terrorism law by not storing my data. So now they have to make a choice. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Yeah. Uh, so about that uh, Facebook algorithm you mentioned, the one for suicide prevention, do you think it reads also the private messaging or just publicly post data? Oh, I think it reads the private messaging. And uh, I don't think it's the only algorithm that reads the private messages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, can, we get a, can we get a mic to the comment guy? Those. <laughs> Applause for those. Yeah, I, have, I have two friends that work on that uh, suicide prevention team uh, in Facebook. Um, and it reads absolutely everything, uh, including, uh, and th this is just, this is not specific to them. Uh, Facebook reads messages that you never even send. Like it re reads things that you type into text fields and then erase. Um, so it's all, it's all part of the machine. And I've told both those friends that they're working for a bad company and they should quit. Um, and I advise anyone uh, to tell that to their friends who work for Facebook too. Okay, some more questions? Hi, so thank you for your talk. Um, uh, two points. One is that um, I got an Apple uh, iPhone for uh, my work as a business mobile and I had the same problem. I didn't want to create uh, a personalized identity and I didn't want to give my credit card and stuff like that. So I bought in a trip, in a business trip in Germany to Apple gift cards and when I go back to Greece I couldn't use them because uh, my Apple identity was registered in Greece, so yeah. I could not use uh, <laughs> that. So the workaround of that is I created a second uh, anonymous uh, account registered in Germany to use the Germany uh, Apple gift cards uh, to, to to my phone. So I don't know if that is the case with you. Because so, so you buy a physical gift card, then use an account to transfer it to a different country user, and then use the yeah. gift card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing. I mean, I, I had the same thing with, with with WhatsApp, a similar thing with WhatsApp. But uh, in in Latvia, we don't even have a possibility to buy uh, prepaid uh, prepaid Apple cards, so we don't have that problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, the second thing, I'd like to have your opinion. In Greece, there is a law that. Uh, uh, the CPs, the routers that the ISPs gives to customers, uh, now they cannot uh, 
change the DNS settings of the router. So they have to be, it's a gray uh, text post that the ISP should only provide to the customers their own DNS services. This is under a regulation law, so the customers cannot uh, visiting uh, sites that are not um, approved from the government. Yeah. Uh, if you know you can change the DNS settings on your um, computer, of course, but um, what do you think about this? Is this something about privacy? Do we need to, I don't know, make a statement, do something else? Well, uh, my first reaction was that cannot be a law, but you seem to know what you're saying. So, so if it's a law, it's a law. Um, I, I, I don't think that's a good idea, but there are multiple ways to circumvent that, right? You could you could tell the the telecom company, I don't want your stuff in my house, so they put it in the in the corridor, not in your house. And you can always chain routers, right? Uh, they can have their router, you can have your router. So in that scenario. Uh, and and uh, I mean I've had similar things in Latvia working uh, working with consulting clients and uh, to, to to make their life more safer. Um, so we don't have that law, but still ISPs push for that. They want their stuff on your premises. Um, so I have multi multi step program which will not work if it's a legal requirement or it might. So the multi step program is as follows: I ask the ISP nicely to please remove the remove the router because we're going to put our own router. If they don't cooperate, uh, we, we just uh, put our own router after their router. And then if the router has Wi-Fi antennas, which is a problem, then we once again ask them nicely to uh, remove the router, or we're going to break off the demo antennas and short them. And, and I've done that for, for, for a client. <laughs> Uh, yeah, more questions. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, if I understand uh, well, uh, GDPR is uh, used to protect uh, my personal data that uh, can be linked to me. Uh, and uh, what happens uh, if, say, a big company uh, can stock uh, or buy uh, data uh, in uh, which uh, the data that is uh, s accumulated so uh, that it can uh, be linked uh, to me. So, uh, well, uh, yeah. So GDPR for big data—that's that's a problem. We we haven't we haven't fixed that. Uh, but uh, I mean, as soon as they have your email address, uh, many DPAs in in different European countries say that that's already identifiable. Uh, it helps to have your full name, your email address, then that, then you know, then it then it works. Uh, for example, I've um, I'm working on a complaint where um, where someone has is referencing my domain in their data storage, and since it has been my domain for 15 or 20 years, uh, and when you open the web page, actually says that's my full name, that's my email address, uh, so. I, I'm kind of trying to pull them into the direction that it is um, that it is private data, but yeah, for big data in general, there's there's nothing we can do under GDPR if if it's not identifiable exactly. I don't know if we still have time for for questions. What do you think? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, couple more questions about how to make your life harder by by being private. What's your experience with the um, GDPR um, um, entity in, in, in your country? Are they are they complete? Uh, are they adequately staffed? Are they adequately knowledgeable? Because in my home country, this this is a big mess, and oh, yeah. so GDPR is basically a laugh because they have they can't do anything. Oh yeah, so GDPR um, entities responsible for GDPR in um, in European countries are, are called data protection authorities or DPAs, and um, our DPA is not adequately staffed, but at least they they finally have a, a good a good leader, a good uh, a good head of the DPA, uh, but they do have problems staffing, and uh, I, I haven't I haven't worked with them for for um, I think two years now, but I just recently about a month ago, which is the uh, the window they had to reply in. Uh, to you, um, I haven't I haven't sent anything to them. Now I have sent a bunch. So what they have been doing uh, two years ago, I think they still can do that. When a month passes, they send you an, a letter saying we apologize. 
uh, we cannot answer right now. We extend the deadline. There is a provision so I can do that, but it cannot be because of understaffing. It's because they have to collect more data. Uh, so technically, at least by Latvian law, I could go to court and challenge that extension. And I've asked the previous head of the DPA, do you want me to do that? Because I can do that, the court can rule in my favor, and then you can go to the government and ask for money. Uh, but they said no. So I haven't asked the, the current head of the DPA if, if, that's, if that's what they want. Because if they want, I'll do that, and maybe, maybe we get some money for that. Yeah. But it's not a priority financially. Yeah, that's true. Right, so um, you can ask me some more questions if you manage to find me in, in the conference somewhere. And uh, thanks. Uh, follow me on Twitter. The slides are on curials.org. Um, you can take a look at them. So thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>